So today we're going to look at section 10.2. We're going to be comparing two population means. And so you might be saying, hold on, how do I have two populations in my problem? Well, here's the thing is that if the researcher decided to have two groups and he or she wants to compare the two groups, then we have two populations. And so I'll give you a real quick example. Let's say, you know, a lot of the problems that we've been doing, we've been looking at, say, all University of Akron students. Well, if all of a sudden somebody wanted to say, hey, let's compare all University of Akron males versus all University of Akron females, um, then we have two very distinct groups and we're going to have two distinct populations at that point because that's what the research, researcher wanted to do and say instead of just having one population there, we're going to separate it into two groups or two populations. All right. And so basically that's what I said here is that uh, we can compare the two groups on a quantitative response variable com by comparing their means. Okay, so let me give you another example. Suppose we are interested in the difference between the mean price of a house in neighborhood one and the mean price of a house in neighborhood two. By the way, if you do this in, uh, for real, you know, a real, real, real study, it doesn't matter what you call population one and population two. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same results. Okay, uh, but in these problems, if we define something as population one, leave it. If you know, same with population two, obviously, uh, because basically you would get the opposite sign otherwise. Okay. Um, but in real life, you can just define it however you want to, population one and population two. Um, all right, and so population one, neighborhood one, population two, neighborhood two, what it, what's, our, what's our variable that we're collecting from each one? It would be the house prices, okay? And so, uh, so what we gotta think of then is that we're gonna have two population means at this point, okay? And we're gonna have to add a little bit of extra notation. And so we're gonna have this, uh, if you will, let me get my pen out that we're going to have these subscripts now. So you're going to have things like mu1 and then mu2. Obviously, it's the population mean from neighborhood one, population mean from neighborhood two. And that means we're also going to have two samples. So we're going to have things like x bar one, the sample mean from the first group. We're going to have an s1, the sample standard deviation from the first group. We're going to have an n1, the sample size from the first group. And obviously, the same would hold true for the second group. Okay. So the hypothesis test can be carried out by doing the following. Uh, what we would do is that we would independently and randomly take a sample from the first group and do exactly the same thing from the second group. We would go ahead and collect the house prices and then we would go ahead and compute things like X bar one, uh, the mean house price from the, f from the sample that came from neighborhood one, right? Because that was population, you know, that was the first group, okay? And so we got a sample mean Okay, so we would look at, say, 50 houses, okay? We would go ahead and calculate the mean of those 50 houses. Well, obviously, that's a sample, and that would be X bar 1, okay? And then we would have an X bar 2, and then the same idea for the standard deviation. We would calculate the standard deviation of those houses from the first group, the second group, and that would be S1 and S2, all right? So here's the idea, is that we would go ahead and compare X bar 1 and X bar 2 by, believe it or not, doing the subtraction between the two, okay? And so this is going to be a really nice uh, starting point uh, for everything that we're doing in this section. Uh, basically, this x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is a statistic. Okay, It is a stat. And it is a wonderful starting point because that's going to be the point estimate of our confidence interval that you're going to see. And actually, it's going to be the numerator of the test statistic when we do a hypothesis test. So here's, the, here's a... Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to make uh, an inference about the difference between population means. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to show you how by doing the subtraction between the two, you're actually comparing the two. You're, you're doing more than just the difference. You're actually comparing the two, and I'll show you how, how that works. Okay. So what we have to realize is that x bar 1 minus x bar 2, it's going to, it's a, it's a, it's a what, a random variable, right? It is something that's going to vary from sample to sample. Okay. So since it's going to vary from sample to sample, that means it has some sort of variation to it, and we want to measure that variation. And so, um, so we're going to have to go ahead and calculate the standard error of the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2, our statistic. Now, don't freak out about it. Here's the formula. Uh, so what is, it, what is this? This is the standard deviation from the first group, and we're going to go ahead and square that, divide that by the sample size of the first group, over here is the standard deviation from the second group, and we're going to simply square that and divide that by N2, and then square root of the whole thing. Okay, that would be the standard error. So uh, confidence interval, uh, basically we can go ahead and make a confidence interval to compare these two population means, and I'll show you how that's gonna work, but let me give you the formula first. So here's the formula. 
And again, don't freak out about this because it's gonna get sim simplified here in a, in a moment. So this right here is your point estimate, x bar one minus x bar two. Here's your critical value, here's your standard error, okay? So here's the thing, uh, for every t, there has to be degrees of freedom. And what we find out is that the degrees of freedom are really ugly to calculate. It's a huge formula to calculate the degrees of freedom. It's not as simple as just simply taking n minus one, because we have these two groups, we're putting them together, and there's all these weighted averages and stuff, and it, it, it's, it's quite complicated, okay? So we're not gonna have you calculate the actual degrees of freedom. And so what we're going to do is, instead of doing that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some software to help us um, pass that point, okay? So, and because we're using the software, everything gets simplified a little bit, actually quite a bit, okay? But if WebAssign says, go ahead and calculate the point estimate, well, you know this is the point estimate, and you know this is the standard error, okay? You may have to calculate those, all right? And if you have problems calculating this big thing, shoot me an email and, and we can go over it, okay? Um, but uh, for the entire confidence interval, we're gonna allow the output to help us, okay? Because of those ugly degrees of freedom. Okay, this is really important because this is basically, if you understand this, it, it you pretty much have section 10.2 under your belt. So if I subtracted estimates for two numbers and I can tell you that the difference will be positive. And so what does that mean? Let's say that we have two numbers. We'll call them A and B. So notice all I'm doing is this subtraction between the two, okay? So I have estimates for those numbers, okay? A minus B, all right? And the difference happens to be positive. So A minus B is greater than zero, okay? So it turns out to be like three. So if I told you that the difference between two numbers, it, and, and the difference is gonna be three, so I got two numbers, okay? And that we're gonna call these A, and we're gonna call them B. And if I told you that the difference was positive, it, let's say it was positive three, it's greater, it's greater than zero, okay? What does that mean about A versus B? Hopefully you say that what? A is greater than B. Let me get rid of um, the, uh, the stuff here so you can see what I put, okay? So here, notice what I put. I put here that this indicates that the first number is greater than the second number. Hopefully that's just obvious, okay? And so, uh, so believe it or not, if you can do the subtraction between number, two numbers, if I can tell you what that difference turns out to be, if it turns out to be positive or negative, I can tell you which one is greater, A or B, okay? So, if, again, if I did the subtraction between the two numbers, A and B, but this time the difference turns out to be negative, less than zero, what does that indicate about A versus B? Which one is, is the larger number, which one's the smaller number? And hopefully, You'll, you'll say, oh, this indicates that the first number has to be less than the second number if the difference turns out to be negative, okay? So nothing difficult about the math, okay? This is simple concepts, okay? But if you understand these concepts, it's so much easier then to work this section. And then last thing, if you do the difference between the two numbers and the difference happens to be zero, okay, what does that mean about the two numbers? Well, that tells you that they're equal to one another, obviously, right? And so if you just have this simple understanding, Interpreting the confidence interval is so much easier then, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a confidence interval for mu one minus mu two. Uh, let's say, okay, so let's say that we actually calculated it. Actually, we're gonna allow the computer to calculate it. Let's say the computer calculated a confidence interval for mu one minus mu two. And that interval contains only positive numbers. What this suggests then is that mu one is larger than mu two. Simple as that, okay? So for instance, let's say that the computer output to told us uh, that the confidence interval for mu one minus mu two is, is four to seven. Now I wanna get something out of the way right now. Please pay attention right here. We are not estimating mu one nor mu two, okay? We are not estimating mu one nor mu two. We are estimating mu one minus mu two. So this right here is not mu one this is not mu2, it is the difference between mu1 and mu2, okay? And so what we're estimating is that the difference between mu1 and mu2 is somewhere between uh, four and seven. So notice that the confidence interval is entirely positive, it's entirely positive. So what we're saying is that, mu, uh, so just to reiterate this, is that what this is doing here is estimating that number, that block, uh, that blue block, we are estimating mu1 minus mu2. 
and we think that the difference between mu1 minus mu2 is somewhere between the numbers 4 and 7. Okay, It's entirely positive, meaning the confidence interval here, this guy right here, is entirely positive. So if it's entirely positive, what did we just say? That means that what? So that means that the first number, mu1, has to be what? Greater than mu2. Okay, Anywhere from what? 4 to 7 units. Okay, so this is what we're making a confidence interval for. Okay, this number right here. All right, and if it turns out to be entirely positive, that's telling us mu1 is greater than mu2 and tells us by how much more. So let's say that we did exactly the same thing, but this time the confidence interval turned out to be entirely negative. Okay, so this time it turned out to be a negative three, uh, excuse me, a negative nine to a negative three. Okay, so that's, poss that's possible here. Okay, and so again, I hope this points it out real obviously now that this couldn't possibly be mu, uh, this number right here couldn't possibly be mu1, and this can't be mu2. It is again the difference between mu1 and mu2. We are estimating this blue box right here, this difference between the two. That's what the, the this estimate is for. So we're saying that the estimate for mu1 minus mu2 is somewhere between the numbers minus nine to a, to a minus three. Well, what is that telling us then? If our confidence interval turns out to be entirely negative, which one has to be the smaller, which one has to be the larger number? Well, this indicates that mu1 had to be what? Less than mu2 in order for the difference to be what? Negative, okay? So we don't know uh, exactly what the difference is, but we do know it's somewhere between what? A negative nine to a negative three, okay? So, and if that's the case, we know which one's greater than. Okay, we know if mu1 or mu2 is greater in the situation. Okay, third situation is that the interval contains the value of zero. And if it contains the value of zero, uh, so let's say that there's, there's a possibility, you know, there's, there's an example that maybe our confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 goes from a negative four to six. Okay, so we're not saying mu1 is negative four, we're not saying mu2 is six. Okay. What are, we, what are we doing? We're making a confidence interval for the difference between the two values, of mu1 minus mu2, okay? And this time, uh, it crosses the value of zero, okay? It contains the value of zero. So if zero falls in the interval, zero is a plausible value for mu1 minus mu2, meaning it is possible that what? It's possible that mu1 could be equal to mu2. And you know what that tells us? Is that there isn't a significant difference, at least not based upon our samples, we cannot tell a significant difference between mu1 and mu2, okay? Because it is possible that they're equal to one another. And so this is basically telling us that mu1 could be greater than mu2. It also could be telling us that mu1 could be less than mu2, but it also could be telling us that mu1 could be equal to mu2. We don't know which one it is. In other words, we have inconclusive results, okay? If that happens, all right? We just can't tell a significant difference between the two, all right? And that's what's going on. All right. How about if we're doing a hypothesis test? Hypothesis test will be very simple. Okay. Trust me on this one. Okay. So the hypotheses, uh, the null hypothesis is that the hypotheses, uh, it, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that has no difference or no effect. Okay. And so there's two ways that you can write it. It will always be this: is that the null hypothesis will be mu1 is equal to mu2, or you could write it as mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. Either way, it doesn't matter. Okay whichever one you prefer. But there is a reason why I wrote both, okay? And I'll show you why later on. The alternative hypothesis, you'll have to make a decision. Uh, either you'll have to write it as mu1 is greater than mu2, mu1 is less than mu2, mu1 is not equal to mu2. And you can write it as the difference, okay? And you may want to write it as, some people want to write it as the difference and understand it that way better, okay? It's up to you which way you want to write it, all right? The assumptions, uh, you need two independent random samples, okay? And then two, uh, either you need the two populations to be normal, okay, uh, or at least approximately normal, uh, and then, or if you don't have that, that means you're going to need the sample size to be greater than or equal to 30 for the central limit the theorem to apply, okay. And so uh, either one, all right. The test stat, here's the test stat, okay. Now this, a lot of people get, get uh, you know, they first see it and they go, wow, that's a big test stat. Well, uh, it gets simplified really quick. And I'll show you why. So 
this guy right here. Notice it has a sub zero. Where have you seen? So when testing mu, okay, the test statistic turns out to be this. Where did mu sub zero come from in that situation? Well, mu came from the value in the null hypothesis. Remember that sub zero? So this is coming from the null hypothesis. Well, where will the value of mu one minus mu two sub zero come from? Well, it comes from the value in the null hypothesis. And so the reason why I wrote it like this is that what's in the value for the null hypothesis? It's just simply zero. So this value right here always turns into zero, believe it or not, when you do this. So this thing gets simplified very quickly. Okay, so there's your test stat. But again, I think um, uh, we'll, we'll allow a lot of computer to do this for us. Okay, p-value. This will be a two-tailed prob uh, probability from the t-distribution. Okay. And I think we're going to do a lot of output, computer output to do this, okay? And it'll be given to us by the software on the test and the homework, all right? And then the conclusion, what do you always do? You always compare, what, the p-value to alpha. Alpha will be stated in the problem, okay? If the p-value is less than, al less than or equal to alpha, you're going to reject the null. If it's greater than, do not reject the null, okay? And either you have strong evidence or you do not have strong evidence, okay? And so... Um, there's kind of the basics there, and so uh, we'll go through some specifics in part two. Thank you.